So I get there and I don't remember how many people were there, 2,500, something like that. I don't, it, was, it was a lot of people. But I remember thinking this when I walked in the room. I felt both uh, ecstatic and completely out of my comfort zone. Like I didn't belong there, right? But then part of me felt like I belonged there because I had never seen so many positive people in one place at the same time in my life. Uh, I That weekend changed my life. It's Retreat and Grow Rich, the podcast. I'm Darla Ledoux, best-selling author, coach, and retreat leader. And I'm on a mission to normalize transformation on the planet, one intimate retreat at a time. This show is dedicated to the coaches, consultants, healers, leaders, and light workers who are here to hold space for the truth that transforms lives and get paid for it. Expert retreat and business tips, strategies, stories, and magic. It's your weekly mini retreat delivered right to your ears. Let's do this. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Retreat and Grow Rich podcast. This is Darla Ledoux. I'm so excited to be here with David Nagel. I can't wait to share him with you. He, if you do not know him, he has a podcast himself and you should absolutely listen to it. Um, but this is a really special interview for me because David was my first mentor in business um, and really taught me fundamental things that allowed me to grow very, very quickly and not experience a lot of the years of pain that I've seen my clients, you know, come to me and they've been through, you know, all of these different things they've learned in order to really avoid doing the work that David helps people do that's made a world of difference for me. So welcome, David. Thank you for being here. Uh, my pleasure, Darla. Thanks for having me. I'm going to share your formal bio and okay. then a little more informal. David Nagel is the best-selling author of The Millions Within and is known as one of the architects of the coaching and personal growth industry itself. Having worked alongside other well-known mentors like Bob Proctor, Marianne Morrissey, Tony Robbins, and the likes for decades. He's the guy you go to when you've tried every strategy and finally realize it's not your strategy that's an issue, it's what's going on between your ears that's the issue. Forever an avid student, David's core mission is to bring expanded awareness and higher consciousness to as many people as possible, to lead them to the life of their dreams, because we were all born to be a success. So, David, I have so much um, to ask you, but my first question is just share with people a little bit about how, you know, personally becoming successful and then teaching others how to be successful became so important to you. Well, there, I think the, you know, it was something that I, I carried around as a question in my pocket as a kid. Um, there were so many horrific things going on in my childhood that uh, I, and at the same time, Darla, I was also going to religious education. So I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. And we were taught you come from a loving God. And I was not only experiencing through television and media, because I was born in the mid 60s, what was going on in our world, but I was also experiencing a lot of tragedy that was going on in my family. And I saw a lot of misery. And I was, and it kept this question is like, if we come from this loving God, why is there so much misery? So I would ask teachers, I would ask uh, the priests, the nuns, nobody could give me an answer. You know, they, I would get answers like, there's just some things that God doesn't want you to know, or, you know, there's, there's mystery that we'll never know the answer to. And I was never satisfied with that. You're like, so, thanks. I want to know. <laughs> exactly. Right. So I, so it was a question that I, that I carried around and then it didn't become really important to me again until I started having those problems as a young adult. So when I started having those problems, as, as a young adult, I had an accident uh, that's pretty well known um, for, for the people that I teach. Where I got, I was water skiing. I got separated from the from the boat and I got sucked through a dam uh, on the the Illinois River in Marseilles, Illinois, and I was almost killed that day. And I came out the other side of the river. I was all you know banged up and beaten up, and I'm hanging from a tree. And I remember it was like it was like um, uh, alcoholics talk about this as a moment of clarity right? Mm -hmm. I had a moment of clarity in my life. 
Yeah. And I said to God, if, if you will, let, if you will let me live today, I promise I will find out why I'm not able to get myself to do these things. Meaning that I had realized, like they tell you your whole life flashes before your eyes, before you die. I had that experience. And I realized that all the problems that I was having in my life was because I couldn't seem to get myself to do what I needed to do when I needed to do it. So I ended up, you know, not being able to earn enough money. I was driving a forklift. I was married. I had kids and more responsibility than I could, I could handle. So I made this, I made this promise. And um, of course I, you know, I, I ended up living that day and I went on this journey for seven years, excuse me, I went on this journey and the journey was um, to find out more about me. That, that's where it started. And I started having these breakthroughs that were significant, Darla. I mean, I was making $20,000 a year, was completely stuck, couldn't move from that spot. I had no education, poor work record. Um, and, I meet, and I went from one month to 20000 to 62000 a year. Now, that was three times the amount. And there should be no reason that that happened. So it caused me to be like, okay, if I can figure out what I'm doing right here, because I'm stumbling upon something, then I think I could change my life around. So then it became a passion to study. And then once I figured that out, I realized that that was my life's purpose, was to actually turn around and teach this as I had made that promise. Uh, because, you know, I, I've thought about it many times. I don't even know where that came from that day. I mean, I've heard people bargaining with God, you know, at, the, at their last yeah. moments or whatever. But to, to those specific words, I don't know where they came from. It was just like my higher self talking to me that day. Wow. That's amazing. Um, I have so many questions about that. And I'm, I'm going to, I have one that I'm going to save for later. So I'll, t I'll give you a hint now, which is um, if you've ever wavered from that purpose, I'm, I'm going to come back to that. Okay. I think that happens a lot for people. At least that's happened for me where, you know, actually I, I grew and grew and grew. And then I went, hmm, yeah, do I still want to do this anymore? And like having to reconnect back into that, which is so huge. Um, but yours was the first retreat I went to. So as you know, my book is Retreat and Grow Rich. Um, thank you. Yeah, when I started my business, I, that was the vision I had, was leading small groups on a journey of transformation. Yeah. And, and that really called to my soul. And I thought about it for a long time. And I would tell people about it. And I would write my, you know, outlines and cute little notebooks and share it with someone and they'd wrinkle their nose at me and go, but how are you going to make money at that? That's crazy. And so I would quit. And I did that over and over again, you know, until I lost my stepdad and that really was a wake up call for me. That was mine. Um, and then I went to coaching school and I started my business and then I happened upon this um, class and it was 2009 when I started my business and I happened upon this class called Recession Rescue with Rapid Results. I remember that. <laughs> and I was, um, I, I, the, honestly, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but the reason I joined it is because I was like, well, here's this guy who's saying all these things that I believe about abundance and mindset and I believe these things. And then he's talking about recession rescue, like we're some helpless people. I'm like, I got to know what he's talking about. And that's why I joined. So I was like, I don't, I refuse to believe in the recession, but why is this guy talking about it? So that's how I came to know you. And yours was my first retreat that I ever attended as a business owner. Um, it was life changing for me. I came face to face with my own fear of disappointment and I was then be able to see that and see how I was creating with the, the small number of clients I had, um, setting myself up for disappointment. Like I was constantly disappointed when they didn't do their homework or weren't doing the things that, that I thought they should do. Um, and, and I was able to move through that at your event. And I call it a retreat because I define retreat as anything that's multi-day and that actually creates a permanent shift in how we're showing up day to day yeah. in our life. So your retreat changed my world. And I also learned that retreats really could change the world in a whole different way through working with you. I hired you and worked with you and came to your retreats. 
Um, could you share a little bit about how you came to host events and retreats and, you know, do this transformational work live? Well, you know, Darla, it was, it was, it was the first, the, it was the first retreat or seminar or however you want to call it that I went to that it totally expanded my thinking. I had a uh, way back in the day or very early nineties, I had purchased Tony Robbins personal power tapes on, you know, his late night, uh, commercial when I would come to work. And, and there's an interesting story behind that too. It took me three nights to actually pull the trigger and buy it because I didn't want to spend the money. I didn't know if it was a, if it was a con or not. Right. right. So I'll tell you where my mindset was back then, but I, I, I bought it and I cleaned out everything in my car and all I did was listen to those cassettes. Right. I listened to him day and night, night and day. And he made an offer to come to one of his live events. And I think now it's called um, UPW, uh, Unleash the Power Within. Back then, the event was called Fear into Power. So um, I decided that I was gonna go, but here was the deal. The deal was it was $3,600 and it was in Ohio and I didn't have $3,600 and I didn't have the funds to get to Ohio e e either. So I ended up, I had set a goal for myself. This is the first goal that I consciously set and achieved was I wanted to buy a fishing boat for myself in those days. So I bought the boat, I paid the boat off, and I sold the boat to be able to go to the event. I was that confident that I was on the right track, that there was something here for me that I needed to experience. So I get there, and I don't remember how many people were there, 2,500, something like that. I don't, it, was, it was a lot of people. But I remember thinking this when I walked in the room. I felt both uh, ecstatic and completely out of my comfort zone. Like I didn't belong there. Right. But then part of me felt like I belonged there because I had never seen so many positive people in one place at the same time in my life. And, uh, I, that weekend changed my life. I mean that I knew from that moment on that I was on, that I was on the right path. And of course, Tony led me to other teachers and eventually to my personal mentor who was Bob Proctor um, but it, it was, if I, I will tell you this, the tapes didn't do it. The tapes were kind of the gateway that, you know, yeah. information that this was, I didn't even know that those things existed. Yeah. I didn't know what self-improvement or professional development was. So the tapes gave me the gateway to go to the retreat. I went to the retreat and the retreat totally, I was totally transformed coming out of the retreat. That didn't change everything in my life, but it changed enough internally that it stuck so that I just kept going. And then it was- a, What it was changed? I, I think what changed, number one, was my optimism. I mean, I became so optimistic. It raised my hope level through the roof. Um, like I said, I had never seen that many positive people before. I was raised in a really negative environment around, and even the town that I came from, you know, it was, it was very blue collar, great people, but not a lot of inspiration. They're really happy just being mediocre and I wanted more for my life. So it was all about talking about what was wrong with life instead of what was right. And when I saw all these people that had dreams and aspirations and goals and um, they were teaching ways of achieving those things, I was just on fire. I mean, it was like, it, 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 it literally felt like something inside of me was realigning, totally, mm. totally shifting. So when I came back from that, it wasn't just enthusiasm, something inside of me stuck. Mm. And it gave me, it gave me the courage. It gave me the, 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 the hope, the focus and the determination to keep going down that road. And I didn't know where it was leading me at the time. I had people discouraging me at the time, just like people said to you, how are you going to make money at this? Yeah. I had a lot of, I had a lot of negative. I'm sure they thought you were crazy when you sold your boat. They totally did. They totally did. As a matter of fact, I got a phone call um, from my uncle when he found out that I was going. And to this day, I'm not sure how he found out that I was going. And he said, to me, oh, I hear you're going to this seminar to become a millionaire. Now, I never said that. I wasn't going there to become a millionaire. I was just going there to figure out myself. And he said, you know, I've been looking for the million my whole life. I've never found it. What the hell makes you think you're going to? And it was like, it was like somebody punched me in the stomach, Darla. I mean, it hurt so bad. I wanted to cry. And then a month after that, he called me after I came back and he said, so you're a millionaire yet? And I was like, what? It, what's the matter with you people? Like, I just knew that I was in the, even with my own family, that I was in the wrong environment. You know, I love them dearly, but 
they did not, they could not see what I could see. And every time I went to an event, my eyes were opened even bigger. Yeah. You know, it makes me think of one of my favorite quotes is by a guy named Kurt Wright. And he says, as a ha human being, we can't accept a part of ourselves we haven't shared with another human being and had validated rather than violated. That's beautiful. And I feel like um, those people validated the part of you that wanted more, that is optimistic, that could see possibility just yeah. by being in that room. Very much. Very much. That was probably the first time in my life that that ever was validated. Yeah, I would say that that's very accurate. That's awesome. I love it. So then how did you start leading your own retreats and events? And I know you do smaller, more intimate retreats, and then you do large events as well. The first one I went to, I think, was close to 1,000 people. It was pretty big. Yeah. Yeah, I've done them, wow, all sizes, uh, from thousands of people down to you know 30 or 40 people. I even had one where I did it for three or four people. That was back, back when I first started. Uh, the way that I did it was um, I had an opportunity when I was working with my mentor to become a facilitator for his programs. And uh, I didn't think I was ready. Um, uh, some people convinced me that, you know, this was definitely what I was looking for. And I realized that I was just scared, you know, but mm. so I, I ended up pulling the trigger and I did it. And I started putting my very first seminar, I had 25 people in it, and it was for three days. So that was the first one, and I've never looked back since. I mean, it has just been a progression from that day, uh, which started in October of 99. Um, and it's, uh, I've just been moving forward ever since, since that day, so. That's amazing. Really cool. So um, ha how have they changed over time? Oh. Like I, my first one, I had 182 PowerPoint slides that may not surprise you, but I had a whole curriculum and the binder and all the worksheets. And yeah. you know, now I go with nothing, <laughs> but a flip chart, but like what's changed for you over time? Well, I still use PowerPoint slides for my big events. Um, not so much for the smaller events. I mean, rarely nothing. There's a few graphics that I'll, sometimes I'll show in a smaller event just so that out of demonstration that PowerPoint does very well. But I'm like you, I use a flip chart a lot uh, because I'm, I'm really teaching based on what the room needs. So it's changed so much over the last 20 years. It, it's incredible. When we first started doing seminars, we were doing them in like uh, basement conference rooms of Holiday Inns, you know, and the only thing people got was water if they were lucky. You know, um, now there's a lot of them. You get food and snacks and coffee and beverages and, you know, they're done in, in upscale hotels. Uh, we try to do ours in upscale hotels. I know you do the same thing. Um, so it, 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 I think that, uh, yeah, you used to get these big, massive binders, right? I remember that. I remember going to Tony's event yeah. and getting a big, massive binder. And it was like you couldn't even get all through. They couldn't even teach everything that was actually in the binder itself. So... Um, it's changed. I think it's changed to be a lot more professional than it was. It's kind of been taken out of the old, dark, dingy conference rooms that they used to be in. And there, there there's more abundance brought into it. it. It's, I think it's legitimized itself mm -hmm. over the years a, a lot more than it was, uh, when I first started, because when I first started, all these coaches and everything that you see today in spiritual healers, they weren't around. I mean, it was a lot yeah. of the old timers. You had Jim Rohn, Tony Robbins, Bob Proctor, Mark Victor Hansen, Jack Canfield, uh, you know, Wayne Dyer. I mean, that was about it that, that was around. Uh, Marianne Williamson, she even, she was, you know, relatively new at the, at the time. So um, today it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of really great people out there. There's also a lot of people out there that aren't that great. Uh, and, you know, they haven't done the work themselves. So I think, you know, that's a negative way that it's changed, that it, that hasn't made it. Like it's easier uh, to break in. Yes. It, people. Yeah. You know, back in the day when I started, even when you, even when you started, you really had to know your stuff to get somebody to, to allow you to teach with them or um, uh, to be part of something. And today it seems like it, it, that's not the case at all. Mm. So that's a little bit disappointing, but I think those people weed themselves out as time goes on. But from a really good standpoint, I think that one of the things that I love the most about the way that the whole industry has changed 
is that it, it really is teaching more of the abundant factor to people. And it's allowing them to have these abundant experiences that they would have never had previously. And I will tell you this, the Tony Robbins event, the first one that I went to, was an abundant, it was an abundant experience. A lot of the ones I went after that weren't. But um, I think, and I know that you share this feeling, that being in the vicinity of those people and the person who was facilitating the event and, and being taken out of your environment and being placed in a completely yes. different environment where you're immersed in this ideology or thought leading opportunity for several days, it changes the way that you think. Immersion is a huge part of why these retreats work. It, you know, and you're surrounded. I mean, everything that you yeah. see is triggering you in a good way, not a negative way. You know, I tell people, I know you do too, that one of the first things you need to change when you go home is you need to work on your environment because that environment was created out of who you were before you came here, right? You're, yeah. You've changed. However many days you've been with me, you've changed, even if it's just a little bit. Now you got to go home and change your environment to match that change so that you continue to grow. Yeah. Talk about the abundance experience and why is that so important and meaningful and how do we create that? Oh, that's a good question. So I think the, I, the reason that I think it's important and meaningful is because we live in an abundant universe. And that's the truth. Hmm. The, the lack that we see, the poverty, poverty that we see either comes out of ignorance or oppression in our, in our world. Hmm. So as people have more experiences of abundance, it's literally rewiring their, their brain they are becoming more aware that abundance is the truth. And the more aware that you become that that's the truth, the more you can step into it for yourself and actually experience it. So I tell people all the time that, you know, I studied for a long time, but the most significant abundance um, uh, effects that happened in my life came when I started working with my mentor because that changed, that changed my abundant thinking. It forced me to change my abundant thinking. Because you saw it in action? Because I saw it in action and he made me do yeah. it in action. He made me do it in action. You know, it's different if somebody says, hey, do this and then you don't do it. But he pushed me into abundance. Like you have to do this if you're gonna work with me. So then it became a necessity to live, to live that way. Yeah. And all of a sudden you begin, once you start to do it, you begin to see it's actually easy to do it, but it's breaking through all of those old paradigms. So the other thing I think that I had a couple of unique experiences as a, as a young adult where I got to be in an, in an abundant environment, so like somebody's really nice home. And I thought to myself, wow, wouldn't it be so cool to live like this, to live in a, to, you know, live in a house like this. Um, and it's like those seeds get into your mind and they resonate with the truth that's inside your soul that I'm not supposed to be living in struggle and I'm not supposed to be depressed and I'm not supposed to be hand to mouth and not being able to pay my bills every month. And the more you put yourself in that environment, the more you stir that desire inside of yourself to actually reach out and, and go for it yourself, I think. Yes, that's amazing. I remember going to my first retreat at a Ritz Carlton that you were hosting and thinking, is there some special code here that I don't know? Like, am I going to survive this experience? Because I just had never been to one and, and growing up, you know, in a family that, you know, we were on food stamps when I was a kid. Um, there's a, you know, the, the word ritzy, right? Is like yeah. an insult. Yeah. Um, when I first moved into the house that I chose without looking at the price tag, um, my mom, her first words when she came to visit were, look at this ritzy place. Um, so, you know, coming from that mindset into operating in the Ritz Carlton like a norm um, was a huge shift for me and caused me to look at everything differently. Sure. Um, and just recently I was at an event where I met several of your clients or past clients and knowing that we'd all worked with you, we knew instantly that we had a common attitude or mindset. And it's not the same in all the circles in, even in the, you know, online marketing industry or the coaching industry, a lot of people are very much still in lack. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, I spoke with someone who was hosting an event, a big event. 
And she was telling me how, um, you know, that she was having trouble filling her room block for her event. And then she proceeded to tell me about an event she was going to and how she, the event was at one venue, but she was staying down the street and two blocks over where it was a cheaper rate because she won't pay more than X amount for a hotel. And it's like, well, no wonder you're having trouble filling your room block, right? So it's not the same in all communities out there. No, it's, it's not. It's one thing to hear that there's an abundance. It's another thing to put your butt on the line and live it. Uh, because you have to live it for both sides. You have to demonstrate it in your life and you also have to earn it, right? So, right. <laughs> you know, I think, and, and, I, and you, you know, the thing is, is that everything in your being, like, you know, the judgment from your mom saying, you know, is it this ritzy? Or I grew up and be like, oh, it's so classy, right? Like you're so classy yeah. or whatever. Or are you a big shot now because you're making a lot of right. money? You know, just kind of derogatory stuff that, that kind of says, um, oh, you're different. You're different than us now. You know, you're, you're too good for your, for your own family. And that hurts. That hurts people. So um, it's like they make this unconscious choice of I can't have this in my family at the same time because they're going to reject me. Yeah. A person has to grow past that in order to step into the fulfillment of why they're really here. So abundance is part of that because we can't do anything in this world without it. We, I mean, we live in a really abundant world and we need abundance in order for it to be healthy and for people to keep growing in a healthy direction. Yeah. Awesome. So besides hosting and upscale venues, um, what other tips do you have for people around creating Im abundance in their retreats and really in the culture of their business? So I always say, you know, I always ask a person, and I mean, Darla, you've been to so many of my events. I always start out by asking a person, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Um, because, you know, even if we live to a ripe old age, it goes by in a pretty quick clip. So we all have the same 24 hours in a day, and we get to choose what it is that we're going to do with it. So we can either make decisions from a lack standpoint uh, meaning that I don't have enough. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough imagination. I don't have enough smarts, whatever it might be. If all those things were yeah. true, I wouldn't be where I am today. Okay. So, and I used to think those things about myself. Um, but if we say, what if, what if this really is true? If this is a truth in the universe, that there's an abundance, that there's more than enough for everyone, what could what could that really be? And I personally started with just take, I mean, I had a 980 square, square foot ranch house when I started doing this. And I thought to myself, I don't have the money to move into a mansion yet, but I can take this place and make it as abundant as I possibly can. So I totally redecorated the whole house. But I also went from there to a $25,000 a month mortgage in a 10,000 square foot mansion in Rancho Santa Fe, California. So it was like a huge quantum leap wow, by putting yeah. myself out there saying, this is how I'm going to live my life. This is what I'm going to do. But then I also went and did the work that was required to make that happen with no excuses, right? There, there, yeah. I would not accept that the sale isn't there. I won't accept that the money's not there. I won't accept that the person that can't fill their room block, that those people aren't there. What, yeah. what is there is, are you making it a priority and proving to yourself that these people are there by going out and taking action, no matter what it takes. So here's what I always ask a person, where are you going to stop? What's going to cause you to stop proving that there's an abundance in your life, right? Because in order to stop, our subconscious mind has to cause a pattern of thinking that we agree with, and then we agree to stop. Nothing stops us. We agree to stop. And that has to do with a pattern of thinking. So say that again. We agree with it, and then we agree to stop. Say more about stop. that. Yeah. So we call it the terror barrier. And what happens is that your subconscious mind does everything that it can to try to prevent you from having a new experience that it doesn't understand what the outcome is, or may have a perceived idea of what the outcome is. So a lot of things that we'll tell people to do may, to them, because they came from a middle class mindset, may seem very risky to them. If you were a multimillionaire, it wouldn't seem risky at all. All you would see is the opportunity in it to make money and help people. But what happens is, is that let's say you're going out there and you're, gonna, you're, you're putting your name and you're going to fill a room block of 100 people, right? So 
we know that that costs a certain amount of money. You have to make a contract with a hotel. You have a food and beverage commitment. You know, yeah, there's a lot of money on the line. So now you have to go out and put the people in, in that room. So as the dates start to get closer and you don't have the people because you haven't been making the calls, you haven't been doing the marketing, you haven't yep. been knocking on the doors, your mind starts messing with you and says, this is going to happen. You're going to go broke. You might go bankrupt. What if this won't work? What if you don't have enough people? If that thought process gets a hold of your consciousness too much, you'll start agreeing with it mm. and you'll just totally collapse and you won't do it because yeah, like this won't work. It just, won't work. Right. It won't work. And then we agree with it consciously. That becomes our reality and we don't break through to the other side. So how often do you see people kind of take the action toward abundance? In other words, buy shit or invest, you know, make decisions to invest, but not take the action. I see it happen a lot. I see it happen a lot. A matter what's of fact, the, why do you think that is? What's um, because I think that I think that they that that part of them truly wants to do it, but then fear gets a hold of them, right? Just fear just grabs them. It could also be that they have somebody else in their life that is not encouraging them, but discouraging them. Yeah. Um, uh, it could be that they're not with a mentor that's strong enough. That it's, you know, Every mentor needs to be stronger than their client. I need to be able to stand for your victory, right? Not for your excuse. So I can't, like, because if you give me an excuse about why you can't do something, I can't step into the same room with you, right? I have to make you step into the room with me where you can see the possibility instead of the reason why you can't. So there's a lot of different reasons why people do this. I remember I had a conversation with Tony Robbins about this many years ago. And I said, about how many people do you think actually take what you teach and succeed with it? He says it's, it's, he says it's less than... He said 80% or more actually fail because they won't go home and do actually do the work and it's not that difficult. He yeah. said if they would, they would succeed. And I have found out over the years that the number is probably a lot higher. But here's an, interesting, here's an interesting thing, Darla. I have never had one client that has not done what we said that has not gotten the result that they wanted. Not one. That's amazing. It is amazing. And, and I have never asked a client to do something that I have not done or been willing to do myself. Yeah. I think that's the key too, right? If you want people to stay in your room blocks, stay in other people's room blocks. As yeah. an example. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you, yeah. you pay your dues and then you can ask somebody else to do the same thing with integrity. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, you know, if, if Tony says 80% actually fail, and the model that I teach with Retreat and Grow Rich, I know you use this model in different ways, um, is a live retreat where people can get out of their environment long enough, like you talked about, to really see their truth and have that validated and gain momentum. And then people go back into their environment and a lot of times without support, will go back, they'll revert. Correct. And, you know, you do the exercise where you have people change the things and their outfits yeah. and then they revert yeah. back, right? The seven dynamics um, of change, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so I recommend people offer a container of support when they go home, which, you know, that was what I, I joined your mastermind when I left the Experience the Reality of Success event. And I'm certain I would have reverted back without that support because right. I saw something new available, both in how I saw you really coach people from the stage without holding back. And I could, and I remember thinking he does what I do, but then I was like, but wait, he's really doing it. And I'm really only kind of doing it. Like I'm holding back with my clients and I knew I needed more examples of that and more of that energy in my life to be able to actually do it. Not to mention, I needed to change my whole life, like where I was living, who I was hanging out with, all the things. And I wouldn't have done it without that support. Um, so talk a little bit about what, what you've learned about that. And, you know, I know you've done a lot of different high level programs with people and what works the best to, create transformation in that retreat and to hold it over time? You know, I think when you start off with that, you're starting off asking your question, the question of what is the person that you're going after? So I think that 
it, it, this, is, this is a fascinating question because I truly believe that you could take, um, like over here on my shelf, I have Think and Grow Rich. You could give that book to one person and they never do a, a seminar, they never go to a tree, nothing. They take that book and they go out and they become a multimillionaire because they did what the book said to do, right? So I think it starts off with looking for clients that really have a desire to change. That's the first key. So over the years, one of the things that I've done is change the clientele that I was actually going after mm. to people that had more of a desire to change. So today, most of my clients are entrepreneurs of, of some kind um, because they, they have a vested interest in actually changing. So that's, that's, that's one of the things. I think that um, off, you know, really studying and understanding uh, where each individual is and you know, meeting them at that place. And then if there's enough of them being able to create something uh, with, you know, like within a retreat, which we do, that addresses that issue specifically. So we have a lot of different retreats that we do that address very specific issues in a person's progression of their growth. So that allows us to meet each one of them. So, you know, our coaches and salespeople, when they have conversations with people at retreats, they're talking to them about where they are. You know, I may make an offer from the stage and say, here, here's my next thing that I'm doing. I'd like you to be part of this or whatever. But when they get into individual conversations, it's also an assessment of where is this person and really what is the best fit for them in their progression of growth. And then actually doing that, not just saying here, here's one thing that fits all, you know, do this and you're going to be a multimillionaire. I think that's what works. Yeah. Meeting people where they are in their growth. Yeah. Awesome. And, you know, I, I might know more about how you create transformation than you do because I watch that and you, you're just doing it naturally, but this is my study. Um, but one of the things I know is you really, no retreat is the same when you lead. You, like you said, you really teach to the room. And a lot of people kind of get freaked out about content and like, am I delivering what I promised? Am I doing what it says on the website versus... I trust that I'm going to show up and sense what the room needs. And I know I've seen you like pull the theme in the room together and teach right to that theme just kind of naturally, I think. But was it always natural? And nope. like, what tips do you have for that? So I'll tell you a story on how this happened. I was doing my very first, I, well, I, first of all, when I first started off, I became very good at filling rooms. That was the that was the order of the day because mm -hmm. I had to I had to be able to pay my mortgage. I mean, I literally quit my job one yeah. day and started doing this a month later. So I had to become proficient at what I was doing. And uh, Bob Proctor asked me to go into business with him and to speak with him, which I was just ecstatic. This was like a dream come true to be able to teach with your mentor, right? So I, he, I, we show up at the hotel for the very first event that we're going to do together. And I had been preparing all week long for this event. And I had like a binder that was, you know, a few inches thick um, about what we were going to teach. And, and he, he called up to my room and left a message. He said, when you get here, come on down. I'm having dinner. Come join me. So I went down and I brought this thing with me. And he said to me, I said, what the hell is that? And I said, well, this is what I was going to talk to you about, like what we were going to go over for the next four days in this event. He said, well, you can just take that back up to your room because we're not doing any of that. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, I don't know yet. We're not in the room. And I said, I don't know. I said, Bob, I said, I don't understand. What do you, what do you mean? He said, you know, David, I'm going to teach you something that you don't know yet. And I said, what's that? He said, I'm going to show you how to let spirit lead you uh, in what hmm. you're already gifted at. And I was like, I was like, I could break out in a cold sweat. Like, you got to be kidding. I'm going <laughs> unprepared. But that's what he did. He said, you need to trust that everything that, you, that is going to come through you is exactly what that room needs. And as it comes through you, you just do it regardless of what it is. So that's where I started. I started doing that. And then um, I never changed from that. It just became so natural. I mean, there's times where my team will ask me an hour before I'm going on stage, do you know what you're going to do yet? And I'll be like, nope. God hasn't told me yet, but I'll know before I get up there. And then it'll come to me. It'll be like, I'll just exact, I'll know exactly what that room needs. And it's never mm. wrong. 
in 20 years, it's never been wrong. That's amazing. Yeah, the more I tried to prepare, the harder it was. And the less I prepare, the easier it is every time. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. So that just makes me really want to ask. Well, okay, so I told you I was going to circle back to this. Have you ever um, not wanted to do it anymore? So your mission of really helping people recognize they're born to be a success and tune into that. Have you ever wanted to stop doing that? No, I've never, I've never gotten to the point where I didn't want to do it anymore. I've questioned the way I was doing it, how I was doing it, the people that I was teaching, um, uh, lots of different aspects of the business, but I never, I've never gotten to the point where I said, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I still love getting on stage more than any other aspect of what I do. Um, I love teaching in all the aspects that I do it, but my, the thing that I enjoy the most is a live audience. Um, and I think that's where I shine in, in my brilliance the most is, is with a live audience. Yeah. So, but no, I, you know, I, I, I haven't, um, I would never say that that day wouldn't come because I don't know what, you know, my higher self has in store for me for my whole life. But right now I'm just as excited. I mean, I have a, I have a seminar coming up this month, a big one, and I'm just as excited about that as I was about the ones I was doing 20 years ago, if not more. I mean, mm. I just absolutely love helping people. Amazing. I love it. So you talked about really saying what comes through. And so I, I'm sure somewhere in this podcast, I have or will share the story of I became gay at your retreat. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about saying what came through. Um, what do you remember about that experience? So I remember that you and I had been having conversations and it was kind of like there was this, there was this aspect where you were stuck. But um, I wasn't exactly sure what it was either. And then one day we were together and it just came to me and I'm like, just say it. And I said to you, Darla, you remind me of a person that's gay that doesn't know that they're gay. And you just looked at me <laughs> and I knew that, it, that, that, that the way that you looked at me, I knew that that like, boom, that, that's it. That's exactly what this, that's exactly what this is. That's, that's what's going yeah. on. And um, of course it, you know. It, it took me a week to catch up. <laughs> but I knew that I knew when it came out of my mouth, I knew that that's what it was. Um, so it, you know, I, I don't, like how did you not filter that? I mean, we had a relationship, we'd known each other, but I think this is where people think, well, that's a crazy thing to say. I shouldn't say that. And that's where we don't get truth out on the table. That's exactly right. I used to have, I used to have, you know, People, people will say to me, you know, you, you just don't hold back anything when you're, when, when you're in front of other people and you're, and you're coaching. I'm like, no, I don't. And I'll tell you why. Because my mentor didn't with me. And had he held back, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. And I'll tell you what, he used to piss yeah. me off all the time. Um, I did not like the things that he was telling me in the beginning. But as I, as I really got to the core of what was going on with me and I started to see those changes start to take place, that went to such a deep appreciation and gratitude for that man coming mm -hmm. into my life. I really believe he saved my life. Like in the direction that I was going, I don't know where I would be today if I hadn't met him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I feel the You're same. <laughs> And so for those of you listening, if you want the full story, it'll, it's in here somewhere in the podcast. So binge, binge, listen, leave reviews, all that good stuff. Right, David, that's what I'm supposed to say. Absolutely. Podcasts. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I have a couple fun questions and you have a gift for people. It's at your website, davidnagel.com. And it is called, um, you were born to be a success. Correct. Um, is there anything you want to share about that? Yeah, you know, it, what it, I think what it does is that it, I think a lot of people don't know that they're really born to be a success. So they, they live this life where they're born to be mediocre or they're born just to be safe. So it's a program that helps them come to terms with the idea that they're really born to be the magnificent success that is individual to them, right? Not compared to anybody else, but individual yeah. to them, the magic, the beauty, 
the abundance that's within them is actually there. It just needs to be brought to the surface. So it's, it's absolutely a fantastic program. Amazing. And it's an audio? Uh, yes. Yeah. So download that. I used to walk my dog in my old neighborhood with the broken glass with your voice in my ear and my headset every single day um, to keep myself in the mindset to remind me of who I am and who I'm meant to become. So awesome. Everybody grab that. So I have some fun questions. I call yeah. this section align with this really quick, simple. Okay. Um, fiction or nonfiction? That you're asking me yeah. to pick one? Yeah. Which, uh, which aligns with you the most? Oh, which aligns with me the most? Uh, nonfiction. I figured. Um, beauty or function? Beauty. National parks or New York City? Ooh. Um, New York City. Come. That can go both ways. That can go both <laughs> ways. I, I do, I love, I absolutely love and adore uh, nature, but I also love the energy of a big city. Nature and excitement. Yes. And good food. And good food. Yeah, for sure. Um, Bali or Italy? Italy. Um, oh, I, I know this one. Employees or contractors? Uh, contractors. Ah, I would have guessed you would say employees. Are your people uh, contractors still? I have both. I actually have both. Um, but I love when people work for themselves, right? So yeah. I, I like to try uh, to give everybody the opportunity to earn as much money as they can. And you can't always do that with employees. So I do have some employees, yes, but I do also have contractors. Awesome. Um, create or repurpose? Create. I am a big creator. So uh, yeah, great. I'll just stick there. <laughs> can't do the same thing twice. Yeah. I can't either. Um, ooh, convenience or challenge? Challenge. Small numbers of premium clients or a large tribe of clients who invest a little less? Small number of premium clients. Beautiful. And then get on giving back. Third world countries or your own backyard? Um, generally my own backyard. Awesome. And I know this one, dogs or cats? Uh, dogs. <laughs> and tell us about your latest little fluffy bundle. Uh, Ferguson? Ferguson? Yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, uh, he's going to be, what is he going to be? Is he going to be six this year or six? Yeah. So I've had him for a year. He's a rescue Westie. Uh, he's a purebred um, that was, uh, he was, he was abused pretty bad. He was used as a stud dog and not treated kindly at all. And um, when my assistant found him, uh, I went over to go see him and he ran right up to me. It wouldn't leave my leg. So it was kind of like we were meant to, to meet and he's just been my little companion uh, for the last year. And he's great. He's a great You're guy. his person. Yeah, I'm his person. <laughs> he warmed up to me a little bit when I met him. So He did. <laughs> he did. Once he gets to know you, he's good. He's, he's a little gun shy. I think that was because of the abuse that he suffered. Um, but other than that, once he gets to know you, he is just a little love ball. Awesome. That's all I have. Anything else for you? No, I, I, I think this is great. And I think that you are absolutely amazing. I'm so proud of everything that you're doing. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things, you know, there's something, there's something about what I do that a lot of people don't know that gives me a tremendous amount of gratitude. One is to see the people that I had that were clients that are now friends that are going out and I was able to help them and they're going out and helping thousands of people, yeah. which is what you're doing. And the other thing is that um, being able to provide jobs for people because we took the responsibility mm -hmm. and the risk of creating our own company and the benefits that that has to all the people that we touch. I really think that that's a very big deal. I think that it goes very unrecognized by a lot of, um, mm -hmm. a lot of corporations and people that are actually doing that. But uh, it, it warms my heart to be able to do that. And it warms my heart to be able to see my colleagues that were once students go out there and be an extension and, you know, help change the world. So oh, that's thank what's you all for about. that. I'm actually hiring this very week. So thank you for that.
That's great. Awesome. So get the download over at davidnagel.com. Definitely do anything you can to get in the room live with this man and listen to his Art of Success podcast as well. You can put this in one ear and that in the other ear and you'll be golden. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Thanks, we'll see Sarah. you soon. Okay, bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Retreat and Grow Rich, the podcast. If so, please share your experience and spread the word. Also, please subscribe over on iTunes and leave us a fabulous review. It makes a big difference in helping to get the word out. And you can join me in my mission to normalize transformation on the planet, one intimate retreat at a time. You can find show notes from this and all of our episodes over at alignedentrepreneurs.com forward slash podcast. If you'd like to understand the inner workings of my retreat-based business model and build your confidence in your retreat dreams, you can grab my book, Retreat and Grow Rich, over on Amazon. It's the Entrepreneur's Guide to Powerful, Profitable Retreats. If you've been wanting to incorporate transformational retreats into your fabulous business model, but you're not quite sure where to start, hop on over to retreatleaderquiz.com. In this short 10 question quiz, you will receive your personalized results, one of six retreat leader archetypes that will show you what your strengths are as a retreat leader, the pitfalls to look out for, and even give you a sample agenda that you can take and make your own. Again, that's at retreatleaderquiz.com.